I uh, really miss my parents and uh, my sisters. I think more and more how I use them as a window on America. They were witnesses I could trust about what was happening in black America. I don't think that the, uh, whew, I guess we would call it the mainstream reveals as much as it masks. So uh, Dr. West has just been in Ferguson, Missouri and I wanted to dive right in and just ask him what's it like, what's it's happening and what does it describe or mean and what can we draw from it as we near this very crucial election in which everything is at stake? Mm -hmm. well, I'd first like to say that I'm just blessed to be at Strand. It's 87 years of this grand institution consecrated by so many people to come through trying to keep alive some kind of book culture and intellectual life and a uh, money civilization. And secondly, just to sit with my dear brother, he's a distinguished man of letters. Uh, just exemplary essayists in so many ways, New York Review of Books and other journals, High Cotton, that, that marvelous novel, what, 1992, I think it is, and plays and so forth. And I just want to take this time to uh, say that publicly to you, Brother Darrell Pigman. Oh, well, you're very kind. Yeah. Read you religiously. Oh, read you regularly. Absolutely. We're just talking about our love for the great Elizabeth Hartwick, who's one of the grand women of letters and I hope we never ever forget her and her legacy and her, 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 her subtle style. But it is true that I was there in Ferguson. I was very blessed to stand alongside some very courageous young people. Uh, people like Ashley Yates, who's one of the grand young leaders who was a product of freedom schools that were founded by Marion Wright Edelman, who's one of the great prophetic voices connected to the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. You all know her poor, you, you know her, her children's defense fund. She's been at it now for almost 40 years. Or people like Tef Poe, who's a hip hop artist, who is a courageous visionary. Uh, Alexis Templeton, uh, uh, Tori Russell, these were some of the young people I was blessed to work with. In fact, I told the mainstream press I wouldn't give any interviews unless at least one leader was, was alongside me. Because I think as an old school brother, it's very important that we first let young people know that we love them and we're concerned about them and we attend to them. But secondly, that they come from a great tradition. Uh, that, that, that sense of subversive memory. So we had long discussions about Ella Baker. Ella Baker, the great grassroots leader, executive director of FCLC and SNCC at the same time. And for them to be able to engage Ella in this particular moment. Of course, they're dealing with what black folk have been up against for 400 years, which is being terrorized, traumatized, and stigmatized. Arbitrary policing. And uh, it was just, for me, it's sublime to see people stand up in the face of power. And it sends ripples so people can, can maybe shatter their sleepwalking, even if only for a moment, and become awakened, willing to organize and mobilize. But we don't know what's going to happen. We, we're getting leaks now, of course, that all oh, looks as if the police was justified. Uh, there's blood on the gun in the, in the car. But no transparency in the process. There's, we're calling for a special prosecutor, but there's no, no response to that request. But as we know, this is systemic. Every 28 hours, a young black brother or sister is shot by the police or some vigilante tied to authorities. You see. So this is systemic. It was Eric Gardner, New York, Kenneth Ch Chamberlain, White Plains, Clinton Allen, Dallas. We can go on and on, Oscar Grant, in Oakland, on and on and on. So I was just blessed to be there. I was blessed to get arrested and go to jail. And we had deep dialogues in jail. and. Uh, I'm always open to singing some Motown songs. <laughs> in it's jail. not Peter, Paul, and Mary anymore? No, no, not Peter, Paul. No, no. That, well, <laughs> with me, it was a little Luther, you know. I, I, I want a little Luther Vandross in there, Curtis Mayfield, Nina Simone. But um, the important thing is to, to remain engaged. They're still at it now for 70 some days. This is, this is unprecedented in the last 20 years young folk organizing for over 70 some days every day they are on fire 
and it's spilling over with, yeah. with both participation within the electoral political system, but also bringing power and pressure yeah. to bear. Now, today is also, of course, the day that me and Brother Carl Dix had called for um, this, some kind of massive resistance to stop in, uh, hyper incarceration, and uh, the number of different activities took place today. I was on the run, but it, but it's part and parcel. Carl Dix also was there with me and arrested. He's my very dear brother. But it's part and parcel of what I hope is an awakening. And that cuts across color and culture. And it even cuts across class. Even some of our well-to-do fellow citizens are recognizing that uh, callous, callousness and indifference toward poor and working people has blowback. You end up reaping what you sow. But that's the beginning of an answer yeah. to that question. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, when we talk about, say, stop and frisk in New York and 600,000 incidents of it last year, that's not 600,000 kids stopped. That's the same kids stopped over, over and over and, and over. over again. So do you think it drives the young people of color away from more participation in the process or has now uh, uh, these incidents kind of built in such a way that they see the importance of actually say voting. Um, Martin Luther King said a long time ago it's not that the danger isn't just that whites keep you from the polls, it's the political suicide of not going to the polls yourselves. Um, do, has the, have the young changed their minds about that or not change their mind, that's the wrong way of saying it, but yeah, yeah. is the electoral process also part of this new activism? I mean, I discern a kind of um, openness or political maturity on behalf of the young brothers and sisters, so for them it's either or. I think they're going to vote, but then Tefpo said, I voted for Obama twice and still got tear gas. And of course what he's talking about is, it's not arguing against voting, but recognizing that voting has its limits, especially when it comes to arbitrary police power or massive unemployment or decrepit school systems and so forth. That it can make a difference, but it won't make the difference. And I think that is mature, because you don't want to lie to people and tell them that just voting somehow is going to uh, uh, generate the kind of fundamental change that's required to address the kind of uh, uh, plights and predicaments yeah. that people are wrestling with. Well, I think yeah. people like me are somewhat guilty. I mean, I sat far away and kind of expatriate having a good time and cast my absentee ballot every four years and thought I'm a really good American. But actually, it's the unglamorous stuff mm, that no, we need true. people to show up for, including the midterms. And so these stories in the Times that people don't know when the midterm elections are being held or they are indifferent. Um, mm -hmm. that I'm thinking of that article about uh, why they are these white uh, police departments in these towns that have these new black majorities and it's because blacks are not yet voting in these towns and mm -hmm. joining the city councils that hire these people mm -hmm. um, but it's sort of time that we do again because mm -hmm. uh, it's made a difference where black voters have uh, no, I think that's true. But but the other side of it is that uh, you were saying your blessed sister lived in Billy Holiday's city, Baltimore. Yes. And you could take a city like Baltimore, which has been a chocolate city for a good while now, and there's a lot of chocolate police, and you still have police brutality across the board because it's a culture. And once you get socialized into the culture of the police that allows you to get away, given that there's no strong accountability of mistreating folk, yeah. especially poor black, yeah. precious poor black people, then at that point it's not just a matter of having black police. No. Now, and I'm, I'm not against that. I think no. it is better to have black police and white police, but it's a structural, institutional, and cultural question, at least culture within those structures and institutions, that, that present a real problem. There yeah. has to be some accountability. You gotta start sending to jail police who kill innocent citizens. Yeah. There's just no way around it.
It's like Wall Street. You got to send Wall Street criminals to jail when they commit crimes, market manipulation, insider trading, fraudulent activity, and so forth. If they torture, you got to send the torturers to jail. The president said they're real patriots. They're not real patriots. Torturers are thugs. I don't care who they are. You see, they're gangsters. Torture is a crime against humanity. So you don't just let them free. But then when Latisha and Jamal get caught with a crack bag, you send them straight to the new Jim Crow. You see, at that point, the criminal justice system itself is criminal. And it loses its legitimacy. And understandably so. Because it's so tilted against poor people. And tilted against disproportionately chocolate poor people, black, brown, red, and so on. Even did though you white poor also. So. Did you sense any shift under Holder in, in this kind of uh, culture of justice? There were some gestures uh, sentencing that he, that he pushed through 2010. It took a while. We put pressure on him immediately. Uh, um, we didn't get any bully pulpit treatment from our, our, our brother president uh, to, to try to awaken the nation. How can you have a system that's quadrupled and over 61% of them are for soft drugs? It would be different as murder and rape for soft drugs. And the, the, intake, the intake among black youth, 12% intake on white youth, 12%, 65% convictions. That's a racist criminal justice system. Oh, Brother West, you sounded like the 60s. No, no, no. I'm just trying to tell the truth. But in uh, Black Prophetic Fire, you point out that this kind of policing of black manhood has been going on since Absolutely. the end of the Civil War, if not before. So but All the way uh, back to slavery. Yeah back to slavery, the whip on the plantation, the lynching doing Jim Crow, and now the, uh, the not just the batons, but the trigger happy police and the use of language of Marvin Gaye and what's going on. Uh, it's, it's still happening. Yeah. Lack of accountability, yeah. you know. I do believe there is such a thing as um, uh, fair community policing. People do need to be protected and they need to be served. But uh, when the arbitrary policing becomes so pervasive that people feel as the police is the presence of an occupying army in that neighborhood, then you're going to have deep tensions and frictions. Are you afraid of the police yourself? Oh, I've always been afraid of police for good reason. I've been pulled over at least 35 times in my life, driving fast, driving slow. <laughs> um, you know, when I was teaching at Williams College in 1982, they pulled me over and said, oh, we finally got the major drugs, drug so-and-so. I say, which drug are you talking about? <laughs> I, I thought maybe it's W. H. Arden's poetry. Yeah, that, that's a drug for me. Yeah, that's that's right. But I go to that. Go to police instead. Got to call the dean. You got got a black man up here saying that he's a professor. <laughs> Rather than the draw. Oh, please, I'm teaching at Union Seminary, driving to Williams College. That's just one example among many, 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 many others. But that's true for most black brothers I know. Yeah. And Larson was a black sister. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now that doesn't mean that you know policemen are not human beings who some of whom can be. Uh, sensitive and so forth. I just tend not to bounce up against those. The one time I was arrested, I did the very manly thing of passing out yeah. <laughs> in handcuffs. They were really scared of me after that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so, real. Uh, that's real. But I mean, that's one of the reasons why Ida B. Wells plays such an important role in this book. Because, you know, when Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois were engaged in their debate about civil rights and education, Ida B. Wells had a bounty on her head. She writes a red tear. She looks the lynching in the face. She looks American terrorism in the face. She looks the repressive apparatus of Jim Crow in the face with unbelievable courage, but also commitment to love and justice, not hatred and revenge. She takes the high road all the time. She's like Martin, she's like Frederick Douglass and so many of the others, you see. Uh, because the experience of so many black people in America is the raw terroristic face of the American nation state, mm -hmm. you see. And the police are just one particular manifestation of that, but it's mm -hmm. the prison system. And mm -hmm. I remember being uh, at a discussion of that book, um, The New Jim Crow by Michelle oh, Alexander, yes, and they asked yes. in the audience how many people had uh, family members who were incarcerated or had been. I was surprised the number of hands that went up, uh, and also that you know all these people looked like me. Absolutely. Uh, you know, sort of nice people, that kind of thing. Um, 
well, semi nice. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. But, uh, uh, I mean, Ida B. Wells, one of the things she demonstrated in her exhaustive research on lynching around the turn of the century was it wasn't always just, oh, the black guy got caught with the white woman, because sometimes yeah, those right. were relationships where the white girl was forced to sell the guy down the river. What she also showed was that in many cases, whites were trying to take the property and the business of middle class blacks, and so they yeah, were simply right. framed. That's exactly um, right. But, you know, uh, one of the things I find so mm, bewildering uh, coming back to the States and listening to what's going on is that everything has to be explained again and again yeah, and again. That's true. Why is this history not kind of in our minds or it is. Everybody knows racism is wrong. Everybody knows this. Everybody knows what racism is and what it looks like and how it feels. That's why they still use it because, you know, yeah, it's right. a very powerful tool yeah, still. But why is it that we seem not to remember from one news cycle to the other that this is, you know, uh, part of a pattern? I remember once someone said the definition of a neurotic is someone who thinks that it's always a fresh episode and not part of a pattern. And as a country, we're rather neurotic. You know, we think, oh, we're surprised, but the pattern has been visible and talked about all our lives. So why is it that, I don't know, things are still going the way they're going? What I can't get over is the sense that we all know what's happening and we can see it but we can't stop it. Mm. Mm. This is what really frightens me, that yeah. even if we yeah. get out the vote and keep the Senate from being filled with these people and, well, they say there's nothing anyone can do about these pastors coming from the Tea Party to the House, but I, I just can't yeah. see how, I don't, I don't get it. I'm, I'm bewildered. Um, see, part why is it that everybody knows but we can't stop it. See, well, part of it is is that it's um, you have to have a public sphere and a public life where citizens can enter and feel as if they have some power. See, the public spheres and public lives have been under such tremendous attack for over 40 years. See, it's a market-driven society. It's weapons of mass distraction, make money, reduce citizens to consumers. They conceive of life as just being stimulated and titillated rather than unsettled and challenged. So that critical reflection is pushed to the margin. And this is especially for our precious young people of all colors, of all colors. And that market culture severs the three dimensions of time, the past, present, and future. So you just get a present that's ever repeating. The past fades away. The future is always an extension of the present rather than different. You see, this is corporate media. This is a market model of education. You know, Diane Ravage reminds us of what? Rich kids get taught, poor kids get tested. So that in, in what used to be public education is now a market commodifies experience and highly militarized in poor communities. No arts programs. We wonder why they can't sing in tune. Right? And still make a million dollars. <laughs> Sarah Vaughn, Carmen McRae, Nat King Cole, Luther Vanbilt, Donny Hathaway, they turn over in their graves. You see? Wonder why they can't play. You have, have bands. There's no bands left other than the Roots. That's the last band. And they on Johnny, on Jimmy Fallon, right? You wonder why they don't have groups singing harmony. I spent a lot of time in hip hop studio. And I said, I, wanna, I want y'all to listen to the stylistic, to, to the Delphonics. I want y'all to listen to the Whispers. Listen to the Main Ingredient. Listen to Enchantment. Listen to the Temptation. Listen to the Jones Girl. Listen to Emotions. See how they harmonize and lift their voices? Now, who you got in the culture right now to harmonize? No set. Just got one microphone, one artist, hip hop artist, shouting. Some of them are lyrical geniuses like Jay Z, some of them just shouting. <laughs> Still making money. 
Well, see, that, that says something about the impoverishment of a market-driven culture, hmm. where you no longer have listening, receptivity, engagement, dialogue, polyphony. You said Duke Ellington's orchestra, John Coltrane's quintet, Elvin got his own voice on the drums. You know what I mean? McCoy got his own voice on the piano. And Coltrane hadn't even started blowing yet. When he does, it's bouncing off against different voices, you see. That whole sense of collective performance, collective action, is lost in a highly individuated, atomized society with the bombardment of market culture, you see. And that's what our young people are up against. And that's one of the reasons why in this book you say, well, I want you all to know young folk, not just in Ferguson, around, around, around the country and even the world, that there are some exemplary figures who are fundamentally devoted and dedicated to integrity, not just cupidity, not just love of money. Fundamentally committed to decency and honesty. And in our culture, to be committed to integrity, honesty, and decency makes you kind of cultural. <laughs> Almost every institution. Oh, you honest? This is survival of the slickest. You ain't gonna never get promoted. But they've always said that. I mean, we've always had this the, the language dichotomy so in our heads between the true. unsold and the sold out. And look how we all turn against the bestseller very subtly, you know, like it's kind of a nouveau riche person or something like that, or they cheated or they sort of sold out. And uh, I some, mean, some, books some, and some best popular sellers, music. Well. Some bestsellers deserve that treatment. I mean, uh, 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 Thomas Pynchon has a bestseller. Well, that's different. When's the last time he had a bestseller? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, he should have a bestseller every time he puts a pen in the paper. But I mean, Tony Morrison has a bestseller. Really? <laughs> yeah, when was Tony's last bestseller? Did Home, well, we don't know. We'd have to get into it. We'd have to see where the Home did. I, think I mean, I find but, that but point, a lot of places function by precedent, that they do it and do it and do it until the formula is exhausted. So hip hop is more than 20 years old, and those white guys at small liberal arts colleges who were writing term papers on NOS and no, you know, true. using that's kind true. of. A, um, Who's the French guy? Derrida. Yeah, you know? Jacques Derrida. This is heartbreaking. <laughs> it's real nostalgia making, do you know? Yeah, yeah. And then 25 years later, what can you do with it? You know? And the same is true in publishing. It's by precedent, by precedent, until it's wiped out. But at the same time, yeah, one yeah. definition of freedom is to have choices. Yes, yes, And yes. so I don't mind that the marketplace is full of choices and that people can put things together. What I miss is some sense of the public, mm -hmm. just the idea of the public, or that we belong to a nation. Yes. Um, I mean, there's always been a kind of fear of uh, the masses in our American political institutions. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's why we have the Electoral College. But do you think that uh, in the digital age, some of the um, devices coming along could one day play a part in something that's more like direct democracy. I'm still impressed that Twitter mm -hmm. kept people online in Ohio uh, in the last election when they were sort of putting around the false idea that polls had closed, had closed. things like yeah. that. You know? yeah. Or that yeah. by directly getting in touch with Congress people uh, Obamacare was passed, uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. when the mainstream was saying, no, 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 people thought, yes, we want this, and they got directly in touch with their representatives and more or less, you know, told them how to vote. Um, but I think that we, uh, uh, in the United States, in the history of this fragile experiment in democracy, we started on a note where there was a commitment to a republic with a fear of democracy. Remember when James Madison says, if every citizen was a Socrates, he'd still be part of the mob. See, that's why he didn't have direct elections for senators and so on. That republic is very different than a democracy. Democracy was not a desirable, favorable term. And then for the first 85 years, the Constitution was what? A pro-slavery document in practice. 
in practice. You see, so so whatever's on paper, there's no reference to the institutions of, of, of slavery in the U.S. Constitution. There's a reason for that. It's not just embarrassing, the conspiracy of silence that the historians talked about. 22% of your inhabitants are generating large amounts of the wealth which is the precondition for your republic. We're not even talking about the land of our precious indigenous brothers and sisters taken in the violation of their people. See? So that democracy is something that emerges from below mm -hmm. and, uh, it, and, it, and when it does emerge, it, it has xenophobic forms. It could be right-wing populism, which is probably what the Tea Party is, is contemporary manifestation. Mm -hmm. Or it can be left-wing populism, which you have multiracial coming together, concerned about justice for poor people and working people across the board. Now, for left-wing populism to take off, you got to hit white supremacy in the face. Oh, that's a tough one. That's a tough. Now we have a rich tradition of progressive uh, vanilla brothers and sisters, but, but they got a lot of. Cousins. Isn't that also generational? I mean, young white people are not like their parents. You know, they're not not, they're not as scared of black people. They're perfectly willing to live in these neighborhoods. They, you know, black culture is not an alien, remote thing for them. Um, right, they know right. black people. They can imagine marrying and and sort of you know Exogamous all that. marriage and interracial marriages. I mean, I sit on the subway it, it, and a, I can't a, tell a Korean kid from a Palestinian kid anymore. You know, it's sort of the 21st century is already happening. 50% uh, of the country under the age of two years old belongs to minority. Mm, that so, scares a lot of people. You know, now. You don't I, say that absolutely. too loud. Don't say that too loud, brother. Well, oh, you know, I, you go around book. saying that they know this too, and so the most startling story I saw in a long time was the Hispanic vote makes no difference to Republican gains in the House. They've already, you know, sort of just drawn the district so that the Hispanic what vote, which they were never going to get anyway, mm. they now mm. don't have to think about. This strikes me as really kind of, I don't know. I wonder why I'm not more angry myself, you know. Um, Anyway, yeah, uh, no, do you have any predictions be. about the election? No, I think it's 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 going to be close, but I don't know which which way it's going to go in these elections. Though I do hope it just it it, it it's holds at arm's length the kind of um, right wing insurgency. There's no doubt about that. It's just that the Democratic Party is just so hard to get excited about. <laughs> uh, it's such a milk toast, spineless group of uh, elites, neoliberal opportunists that they are. Uh, but. Well, you know, but, on they, but, hand, but on the other hand, I would take them over to Tea Party any day. Oh, Come no on. doubt about that. You know. No doubt about that. But and as you said, they are making a mistake not running Obama, not letting him speak and campaign. He remains the most glamorous figure in the world. You know, he's president of the world. And actually, when he appeals to people and says, this is what's going on. This is what we But he's been on the road the last few days. Huh? Yeah. He did go on the road a little bit. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah f no. finally. No, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Anyway. So now that um, we've talked, perhaps you can. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's a great honor to sit here and talk to you. It's so an honor to talk to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So. At this point in time, we are going to open the floor for a few minutes to audience questions. Please raise your hand if you've got a question, and I'll bring you a microphone. I know that uh, you're not a fan of Mr. Obama, Mr. West, um, but one thing he could do, I was shocked when I saw the, the um, today, the, what, with John uh, Stewart, he said they don't keep track of police shootings and police killings on a state level, on a county level, on a national level. Mr. Obama could do an executive order and have that tomorrow. Why doesn't he do that? And why don't they hire people with over 100 IQ as officers? <laughs> That's kind of odd. <laughs> No, I, I think your question about uh, the use of presidential power. You see, when it comes to uh, keeping track of Brother James Risen, he's quite willing to use executive power to keep track of him. He's about to push him into jail. See, when it comes to assassinating four American citizens without due process or judicial review, 
he's pretty tied to the imperial presidency that goes all the way back to earlier presidents after World War II. So that there's uses of presidential power that tilt toward the weak and vulnerable. There's uses that tilt toward keeping track of the Ed Snowdens and the Mannings, the Chelsea Mannings, and, and, and so on, you see. So those are the kinds of questions I think that need to be need to be raised. I mean, even in regard to Ferguson, the young folk are very aware that the, uh, the massive transfer of the most sophisticated weaponry took place in the last five years. They knew what was going on. This was under Brother Eric Holder, too. Yeah. And what, eight of the Black Congressional Caucus voted against it, all the rest of them were for it. But this was, this is in the, in the shadows. It's behind the scene. That's what it is to be part of a neoliberal regime that's tied with three tendencies. Financialized, privatized, militarized. And, that, and, and, and it, it disproportionately affects the weak and vulnerable. Financialized, 1% of the population own 42% of the wealth. Big banks dominate. They don't produce products, they produce deals. Very different than the old, earlier versions of capitalism. American Motors le at least produce products with workers. Hedge fund and others, they don't produce any. Anything other than just making money. Specula speculation on the casino, uh, on a casino like, uh, 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 in cas casino like activities, you see. So that, I, I think that there are certain uses of executive power that could tilt in much more progressive directions. And this would be one example in terms of um, at least having statistics and data, how many folks. This is going to be, though, the new sort of white collar, blue collar job of the future, data farming. It's going to be like uh, the German Democratic Republic where overemployment was in the secret security watching everybody else. They collect all this data and we don't care now because they can't process it. But if they start sort of hiring people to sit there and go through it, it's a different world. Um, but all these things, it's almost by inertia. You know, it's like prisons are such big business, or the war on drugs is such big business Absolutely. that you can't sort of grab it by the tail like a buffalo and turn it around. You know, it really is a commitment to, um, yes, dismantling a whole sort of system that's grown up to absorb this federal money. So. Other questions? Just I'm just going to gonna bring you a mic. It's, it's Brother Bobby, Brother Bobby, good to see you. Listen, I've, I've been a cop 28 years. I've been a cop 28 years, and um, most decorated cop in my city. It is so brutal in the police departments. When you make a stand, understand something, I've done a lot of community stuff. The most decorated. I went through death threats in my own department. I had niggers scratched into my locker. I had, when I did an affirmative action fight back in 91, I would say 85% of the department wouldn't talk to me, nor back me up on calls. The culture has to change, and the only way it's going to change is exactly what you're saying. Until cats have to go to jail, until cops have to go to jail, because when black cops do stand up, the few that do, like I did, they go after you with a vengeance. Oh, yeah. Until these cats go to jail for what they're doing, it's never going to change. It's never, there needs to be, and I'm a cop, there needs to be civilian review boards. You can't have cops watching cops. You can't have bankers watching bankers. That's right. That stuff does not work. And I've lived it for 28 years. I just wanted to tell you that. As a sidebar, your black prophetic fire. Talk about, even back in the day, when Dr. King was doing his thing, how the black voices went against him. Carl Rowan, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., Thurgood Marshall, That's right. Whitney Young. A lot of these younger folks don't know, I didn't know, that these brothers went against him. That last year of his life, 65% of black America thought he was ir irrelevant. When I look at today's scheme, I see you, I see Tavis, I see very few people with that black prophetic fire. We didn't have it when Dr. King was here, besides Malcolm and, 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 and Dr. King and a few others. 
Today, besides you cats who aren't in the politics, there's nobody out there. How does this get rectified? No, I appreciate uh, both sets of remarks, though, my dear brother. Uh, um, you're right. When Martin died, 72% of white Americans disapproved of him, and 55% of black people disapproved of him. Uh, when I speak in different churches, people say, you know, they, they mobilize against attending his lecture. They said he's an echo of Radio Hanoi. That's what the New York Times said after Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous speech on April 4th, 1967. And that's the liberal newspaper. You can imagine what the right wing was saying. You see. Why? Because it was a critique, critique of American empire, critique of Vietnam, and all he was saying was that Vietnamese babies are as precious as babies in America. And see, this is part of what needs to be said by highly visible leaders, spokespersons, politicians, and others. The reason why you send the policeman to jail is not out of vengeance, it's because the lives of poor black w girls and boys has exactly the same status as the lives of white boys and girls at Exeter and Andover. It's just a basic moral, and I would say as a Christian, a spiritual statement. And it needs to be said over and over again, and our policy needs to reflect that. The reason why the, the, the culture, the police is exactly what you're talking about and you had the courage to stand up is because when there's no accountability, there's no answerability, there's no responsibility, they do it over and over and over and over and over again and it becomes routinized. Arrogance and power. Absolutely. And it's something I think it's inside of all of us. Insulation against accountability. You say what? Insulation against accountability. Absolutely. We act with impunity and come up with mechanisms to ensure there's no accountability but ever. Is there a kind of unspoken thing in the general population that's behind the police because they buy that attitude yes. that they're the thin blue line against the marauding hordes at the gates? That's, that's exactly right. Don't you think that's a that's large problem? That's exactly. But we also know, and this is where it's not just race but class, we also know if the police were killing white brothers every 28 hours, what would be the response of the nation? It'd be like Newtown, Connecticut. All hell break loose, town meetings everywhere. And in terms of black leadership, if this were happening among the black upper middle class youth as opposed to black poor youth, you'd have different kind of black leadership. But even the black middle class have become too indifferent to the plight of black poor youth. And they understand that, they feel that. That was part of the meeting that took place that Sunday yeah. night when they took yeah. over the meeting. I don't know if that's entirely true, but I know. I mean, I mean, it's, well, it's too, it's too pervasive yeah. in that sense. Yeah. But uh, you, you, of course, you've got some black I remember, uh, class folk concerned, but it's still, it's not the sense of urgency. No. It's, you get some no. of the Jack and Jill brothers and sisters going to jail at the same level of, as folk on the ground in, in the hood. You have different kind of black leaders. Even the churches will have stronger prison ministries and prevention rather than building funds and the pastors with CEOs with the Bentleys. Yes, but we've had a lot of examples recently that show that police don't care if you have a Phi Beta Kappa key, uh, just as in the past they never cared. I remember one of his classmates from Hawaii said that, you know, in Hawaii everyone's a mongrel. It didn't sort of make it's any difference. Yeah, but once yeah. Obama got to LA and the cops there treated him as a black youth, then he understood what his mother had been trying to tell him all those years. Oh, yeah. So. Oh, yes. Yeah. I have so many questions, but I'll ask something, some basic, just two quick basic ones. Um, with the shutting down of independent black owned newspapers, independent black owned bookstores, uh, magazines, uh, the coverage of books, the coverage of culture is, is really down to Twitter and social media. Uh, what should we be reading? What books should we be reading? What publications should we look to? What bookstores should we support other than the Strand? Of course, they're a fabulous institution. Absolutely. But what would you recommend that we should support in order that it stays viable, and vibrant, mm -hmm. and thrive? Mm -hmm. And you jump right in there as, <laughs> as, as well. Um, because it is true, I mean, given the monopolizing and the corporatizing that takes place in the music industry, just a few companies own recording, radio, and video, and live performance. 
So you're going to end up with certain kind of products. Uh, in the book publishing world, struggles over Amazon, the incorporation that becomes, that moves toward monopoly, it makes it difficult for Strand, uh, court books. I was just in court books in Brooklyn. I always try to make sure, I spent a whole lot of time, I used to always start with, with Human in Harlem. I insisted, every book I come out, I'm starting with, with my folk in Human. Now that's gone, they say. Uh, um, this is part of the structural institutional tendencies of, of, of highly financialized uh, monopoly capitalism. What do you defend? Well, you, I mean, for me, I start with democracy now. I start with Sister Amy. She's holding on. So at least you get some counter view, some alternative perspective on things. See, I don't believe anybody has a monopoly on truth. But some folk are more truthful than others. There's more truth on democracy now than Fox News and MSNBC. Fox News is just right-wing propaganda. MS, MSNBC is just neoliberal propaganda. And they're going at each other. They're dependent on each other. They're parasitic on each other. That's why you can find out more about Rush Limbaugh on MSNBC. Because they always have to show what he's saying every day in order to respond. And don't realize it's just a neoliberal propaganda, parasitic on the right wing propaganda. Where he is, the larger context, concerned about justice and poor people in the prison industrial complex and Wall Street, drones dropping bombs on innocent people, massive surveillance, hardly anyone in the mainstream. Black Agenda Report is something I, I like to read with Brother Glenn Ford and the others. Um, Counterpunch. Very important, I like to read. What else do I like to read? Common dreams, if I'm not too sleepy. Uh, I'm sure there's some other truth dig. Uh, it's, it's, it's very good with Brother Chris Hedges. It's something that I like to read. Not, Sister Klein, Naomi Klein's work is very important. Norm Chomsky is, is very important. If you want to move toward progressive liberals, Paul Krugman. You know, one out of three articles. <laughs> <laughs> I love my brother, but I, I'm not a liberal. I'm a revolutionary Christian. So I'm very critical of the liberal. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> How would you characterize yourself? I'm really brother? sentimental about white liberals. About, about white liberals? <laughs> yeah, I, I really like oh, them. Oh, they can... <laughs> I mean, it, it can be dangerous, I'm telling you. Ooh, no, you get the fox over the white liberal. Oh, no. Lord have mercy. I can handle it. You're going to no. need a little Holy Ghost, too. I think you take in your, your news or your uh, whatever from a range of sources now. Um, anywhere from uh, Friends, Twitter, Times. Mm. Uh, mm. I still look at the New York Review of Books and the New Yorker. What N plus one. Bill Sorry? I said, what about Amy Goodman, Democracy Now, and Bill Morris? Yeah. Okay. And that's the truth. Yeah. You know, right yeah. out there. Yeah. Every week. Yeah. And, and Amy, uh, every day. Yeah. Both on radio and TV. I think that those days of uh, Walter Conkright and the national narrative mm. are gone. No, you're you right know. about that. Uh, well, there's a different national narrative. Talk about revolution. It's it's called truth. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Tom Hartman, very good. We do have another question back here sure, in the back sure, of the room. Sure, sure, sure. And you have a question, another question. In front. Hi. Um, bouncing off your earlier comments, both of you, about the relationship between police culture, police murder, and the bigger culture and fear, I kind of want to go someplace else and ask you both kind of to comment on how you would look at the the trajectory maybe of morality in this country and public morality over the last couple of decades, you know, since, since the uprisings of the 60s, since the time when things were clearer, what was right and what was wrong to more people. And I know, I know Dr. West, that you're speaking at Riverside Church on the 15th in a dialogue on revolution and religion, the fight for emancipation and the role of religion with Bob Avakian and that you're a revolutionary Christian, he's a revolutionary communist atheist, but I know that morality and the question, how can we be good without God, you know, is there another way a society could be, that those things are not just political, those things are, go to mm -hmm. deeper levels, and since you both write about those things a lot over the years, I was just wondering if you'd mm. comment Mm. Not just on the fact that the police are brutally murdering people, but what's going on in this country when people can tolerate this? Yes, yes. 
Do you want to say a word about that? I mean, I, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to respond to that well, uh, I, uh, I as well. Try not to blame Reagan for everything, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I think when you know the, under the deregulation of capital, something happened, and people started to see that if they can get away from it. I mean, get away with it, yeah, then I should get away with it too. And it kept going till the whole thing sort of unraveled. That, you know, no one was willing to be the fool. Uh, that everyone wanted to get his. And I don't think that's changed. What's added is this sense now that something is very finite about our world. And there's not enough to go around. Uh, and that people are in some ways very... Um, distrustful or, mm -hmm. or um, you know mm -hmm. uh, think I can, I can only do so much and beyond that I can't go I think that our reach and our social imagination is uh, are not the same yeah. you know yeah. I'd like to help you but I can't well, one, I, I, I do look forward to being in dialogue with my dear brother Bob Avakian. We're going to have a good time because he's got much to say. He's, he is the real thing in terms of trying to be honest, even given my disagreements that I have with him. But we have to keep Thank in mind, it, 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 it was under Reagan that a thousand people went to jail as a result of the savings and loans catastrophe. But how many went to jail under the Wall Street catastrophe of 2008? Zilch. But that's a decline in morality. That's a sign that you can get away with metaphoric and literal financial murder with no accountability whatsoever. In fact, one of the major ones, Brother uh, Jamie, the head of uh, J.P. Morgan. Morgan Chase, he's sipping tea with the president. And when they get caught, what do they do? They get charged money. Negotiated Tax write-off, negotiated settlement. You see, that's, that's no accountability at all. You never say you did it. You see, no responsibility. Write a check. Can you imagine engaging in a crime? You and I, well, I wouldn't want to get you in trouble, brother. No, I know. But you, <laughs> you and I commit a crime, and we call the folk up and say, well, we got some big money. Ofra's a friend. She got some money. She's going to help me out. So I don't have to go to jail. No, the legal system doesn't operate like that. That's big money dictating. That's Wu-Tang Clan cr cream. You got cash rooting everything around me, right? That's a decline of morality, you see. And the, 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 made the dominant tendency right now is very much toward a police state, a crypto-fascist regime, where big money gets away with murder, regulates those very tightly who would constitute forms of resistance with an emaciated public fear. There's no public conversation with no serious public education. So you're not going to get any Socratic energy. There's no critical engagement at all. You're generating sleepwalkers and consumers. What is that? But that is what you call soft fascism. You see? And when you do try to engage in serious critique and resistance, as the Occupy movement did here in New York City, it was a marvelous thing, I thought, right? You get brutalized, you see. Now, people say, oh, well, that's what, because Sheldon Wolin, of course, needs to be invoked here. He's probably the most important theorist of democracy in the last 50 years in America, right? And he's already talked about the soft fascism and the, uh, uh, the kind of uh, totalitarian tendencies of unaccountable political power, unaccountable economic power. The deregulation of markets went hand in hand with what? The degradation of workers, the fracturing and the fissuring of working organizations so that working people feel more and more helpless, impotent, they can't fight the the bosses and the powers that be, traditionally that was one of our counter, mm. uh, counter uh, mm. uh, forces against greed at the top, you see. So what else is possible? You got rebellion, that's not revolution, we got rebellion, you see. And you got right wing populism. I mean people used to say on the left, when we were coming along in the 60s, America needs a revolution, America only has the capacity for counter revolution. 
because I used to travel the country with Michael Harrington. He's my dear brother, Democratic Socialist, part of the legacy of Eugene Debs and Norman Thomas and others. So I'm pink rather than red in that regard. Um, uh, different than Brother Ovechkin, who's mm -hmm. a serious communist. And I'm, uh, but uh, we were reminded at every lecture that for every socialist in America, you probably got at least 15 members of the Ku Klux Klan. That's counter-revolution. Right? I, I, I get calls all the time. He got over 1,000 white supremacist militia groups. And they say, Brother West, you on the list of all of them. People ask me why I'm a Christian. She. <laughs> I need some spiritual strength, God dang it. No, I'm just being, I'm being facetious. But I mean, the point is, is that the right wing, organized right wing, with guns, serious. And that's why these six figures that we talked about, in, that I talked about in this book, each and every one of them either had a bounty on their head, were killed, were murdered, or knew they'd be murdered any, in, any minute. Because when you tell the truth about society in terms of white supremacist connection to capitalism and empire, and if you constitute any kind of threat, you got fellow citizens before you even get to the police who will kill you, he said. Because we do have a certain right wing tilt given our history mm -hmm. with the, the racism and the, uh, the sexism, the homophobia and so forth and so on. And that is sobering. So then the question becomes, well, you do it because it's right, just, and moral, period. That's the kind of human being you choose to be. This is the thing about the Constitution. It is a document that always says you can believe in social progress and social justice, that it can happen. That here is a structure where everyone can sort of Mm -hmm. You know, make that attempt. Some possibility. Yeah, some possibility. You can't live without hope. Oh, no, I agree. You can't. Well, we have to define what hope is. You see, hope is not... Not letting them win. Not letting them win. Oh, yeah. I would say it's, it's, it's a little less than that. Uh, more with Chekhov than with the romantics here. No. Full out with Byron. No, no, no. I think, I think, actually... Even oh, back, and I, even until back, I read your book, I didn't realize how much Frederick Douglass was interested in Byron. It's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. We do have time for just one more question this evening. It's going to come from. Well, maybe can we have two? I think I did. So okay. We can do two. Sure. Okay. Just a quick one. Um, but short answer. Based on yeah. your time in Ferguson. Yes. They've got to come up with. E they're either going to indict this officer or not. That's right. What is the plan if there is no indictment? Was that discussed at all? Is there a plan about that? Is there a next step? Because it looks like it's going in the direction of no indictment, it was justified, and so forth and so on. There were a number of different views that you can imagine. There was no consensus reached. There was certainly a sense that there would be a certain kind of explosion. And um, see, for me, as a, uh, a cold training, uh, uh, in the sense that John Coltrane's love supreme, that love is non negotiable. So your rage has to be filtered through love and justice, not hatred and revenge. But that is said, more easily said than done when such perceived gross injustice takes place. But those voices of love and justice must be in the mix. Because even the rage taking the form of hatred and revenge just reproduces the same kind of hatred, revenge, domination, and so on. But th th there was a sense they're gonna explode. The question is then how do you try to channel that rage in such a way that it's much more constructive than destructive. But that's going to be tough. And that's not just Ferguson. That's every city in America. Ferguson is a national phenomenon. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I appreciate that question. We got one more and then... Mm -hmm. You make some uh, fascinating comparisons between Malcolm and Dr. King in your book. Um, you read the book already? Yeah, I did. Oh, I salute <laughs> you, my brother. I salute you. Appreciate it. For me, that. the fascinating part of you know that comparison is to to what extent 
did they have a personal relationship? And, and what were, if, if do we have any knowledge about uh, the feelings, you know, the human feelings that they had for each other? If you could go into more depth about that relationship, if they had that personal relationship with one another, and what they felt genuinely, genuinely for each other. Yeah, yes, yes. Now that would be the subject matter of another uh, magisterial book. To have those two towering figures examined in such a way that we could get on the inside of their heart, minds, and souls and get a sense of what they were thinking privately as well as publicly. We do know this, that in June 26, 1964, Malcolm X had called for a, week, a few weeks earlier, he'd called for a, um, a gathering of black leaders to come together to take the United States to the United Nations for the violation of the rights of black people. Because Malcolm breaks from the Nation of Islam in March. Uh, and uh, um, that June, of course, there's tremendous black life loss in Mississippi and so on. Martin sends his lawyer, Clarence Jones, to the meeting and says Martin was willing to go with Malcolm to the United Nations to put the United States on trial for the violation of the rights of black people. You see, two days later they tried to get together. They couldn't. Two days later Malcolm leaves. He goes to Cairo. His food is poisoned that same day in Cairo. He moves in Middle East and so forth. They never get a chance to come back together. But there was an openness, there was a willingness. In 1955, Malcolm did not have pleasant things to say about Martin Luther King Jr. One thing we love about Malcolm, the brother was sincere. <laughs> so he gonna speak his mind. And he thought that anybody who told, told black people in the face of violence to take, turn the other cheek was dot, dot, dot. We, we, we can read it, I won't say. He's not cussing, he's a black Muslim, but he still has some hard language on, you see. But he was saying it out of love for black people. And that's what I like about the brother. Even if I disagree with him, I know it's coming from a love spot. We on the love train, but we got some different analysis. Now granted, he didn't, he didn't love white folk at that time. He thought they were devils, and he's wrong about that. But he was also trying to keep track of devilish behavior on the vanilla side of town. That's necessary. That's very important. You see, out of love for folk who are being victimized and being dishonored and so forth. But that was a major attempt to bring the two together. But early on, because Malcolm had come out so harsh on Martin, Martin would always, you know, hold him at arm's length. Plus, you had the real southern and urban difference between them. Uh, and also, I think once Malcolm was in trouble himself, he reached out to Martin Luther King as a way of expanding his own political education, so to speak. Absolutely. But they were drawn to each other as the two guys who said the same thing to black people that they said to white people. You know, they weren't two-faced about uh, either one. And you can see how much time has gone by. They used to be held up as such opposites. And now we accept them as part of the same story and one necessary to the other. And the wonderful thing about them is in our age, because we live in the age of the sellout. You see, the cupidity is tied to venality. Sell your soul for a mess of pottage. Access to power is a new crack. I want to get to the White House. I want to get to the City Hall. I want access to some visibility at any cost. Right, so it's just a matter of being successful rather than also what you're faithful to. Nothing wrong with success, but the question is, what do you use it for? Martin, Malcolm, Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, Barnett, Ella Baker, they would never, ever sell out. Ever. That's integrity. That's what's needed, especially for our young folk. That's decency. That's honesty. You see, and pay, just, and, 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 pay teachers, and 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 what? Pay teachers, and and pay teachers, and pay teachers. Well, they're the that. ones with integrity in students. Oh, oh, you mean? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If the teachers yeah. are elevated and given the kind of status and stature and financial support to be able to pass on these great traditions of integrity, honesty, and decency in our schools, you're absolutely right, definitely. But with Malcolm and Martin. They were the real thing. 
That's what's magnificent about them, you see. And they could so, both write. They were and, good And both could be wrong. Martin was wrong. No, I mean, they were good writers. No, oh, 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 yeah, and that's it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I got you, I got you, I got you. Yes, indeed, indeed. But I know it's getting late, but thank you so much, Sister Emily. Absolutely. On behalf of the Strand, thank you so much, thank Mr. So Pinkney much. and Dr. West, for joining us. <laughs>